Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for being here on this gorgeous day. I'm Margaret, I'm the president and CEO of the Executives Club of Chicago. We are thrilled to welcome you to today's program, The Financial Future of the City of Chicago. Today's special event will be a conversation with Mayor Lightfoot and the fiscal team who's been responsible for the City of Chicago's financial upswing. We'll hear how they tackled the city's finances to create change and provide a fiscal path forward for the city's future. Throughout the program, we do encourage you to submit questions. We'll see how many uh, Mayor Lightfoot gets through. I know she has a ton of questions of her own, but you can text EXEC, E-X-E-C, to 22333. That's also on your program, in case you forget. And now I would like to introduce our panel. Joining us from the offices of the City of Chicago are Jenny Huang Bennett, Chief Financial Officer. <laughs> Susie Park, Budget Director. <laughs> and Rush Masoni, City Controller. And Mayor Lori Lightfoot, 56th Mayor of Chicago, will moderate the discussion. <laughs> Mayor Lightfoot, I just want to personally say thank you for everything that you've done, both for the Exec Club and the entire Chicagoland business community. We are thankful for all of your leadership these last four years. I'm such a supporter of our mission to connect and grow all of the city's business leaders. We wish you so much success in the years to come. Thank you. We can't wait to watch what you do next. And now the floor is yours. Thank you. So good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for uh, being here. I think there's a little reverb. You might be able to adjust it. Um, I want to thank uh, Margaret um, and the executive club and the board who have been such incredible partners um, on our journey uh, over these last few years. I also got to give a shout out to Michael Fastnock and the incredible team at World Business Chicago who are the co-sponsors for this event. A few weeks back, um, as we were kind of looking at what the numbers uh, were gonna look like, um, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the, the tease, great news coming. Um, I immediately called up Michael in the uh, meeting and said, hey, we should talk about this, um, and WBC should sponsor. So thank you for always saying yes, and thank you to the team. I also want to um, say thank you to key partners um, who are here, and without whom uh, support, we would not be in a place that we're at. We've gone over some tough terrain in these last four years, um, and it requires partnership. And first and foremost, it requires partnership uh, with key uh, city stakeholders. So I want to thank um, our great treasurer, Melissa conyers Zervin, who's here with us today. I, I want to thank her uh, lesser half, uh, Alderman Jason Irvin, who's here with us today, chairman of the Black Hawk. Melissa, you know I had to do that, right? Keep him a little humble. Um, I've got to thank uh, the chairman of the Finance Committee, uh, Scott Wagesback, uh, for his incredible leadership. It's nice to have Finance Committee leadership that is ethical and honest and transparent. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I also have to thank um, uh, somebody who I didn't know uh, before four years ago, um, but I will now know for the rest of my life, who's been a ride or die, um, has reined me back when I needed to, mostly successfully, um, but also just been somebody who has been a stalwart leader of the city council, steady as she goes. I love you, Michelle. Alderman Michelle Harris. And as I look across this room, I also want to thank uh, the other business leaders who are here. Um, the, the, I think one of the great lessons of this time is making sure that people understand that partnership with the business community is absolutely essential to the city's success. And I'll dwell upon that uh, in a minute later, but we can do uh, make sure that the economic engine of our city, the downtown area, continues to thrive, and we can simultaneously make sure that we continue to breathe economic life into our neighborhoods. This is essential for the city, I think we set this mold. Um, we are excited about what we um, have been able to do in partnership with so many. Um, but I also want to just thank all the business leaders uh, who are here that make this the great city that it is. Thank you all. So 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump on the Wayback Machine for a minute to kind of set the scene for uh, today's, I think, exciting announcement. Many of you recall that when we came into office, we faced what was then the city's largest budget deficit of $838 million. Now, we um, had a glimpse uh, that the numbers were bigger than what the previous administration had said. Um, and, uh, but when we really got in and started looking under the hood, it was much worse than uh, we had even uh, understood. And so we had to get to work. And what we did is we came up with a budgeting philosophy, I'll call it, um, that has really served us well and guided us through each of these challenging years. And I want to make sure I share this with you to set the frame. We said the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look inward first, meaning we are going to figure out how we can make city government run efficiently, run more effectively, without going to the taxpayers and reflexively saying, pay us more. That was critically important for everything uh, that we did. We also said that budgets aren't just math problems. They're value statements. And we've got to continue to speak our values, even through challenging uh, circumstances, to make sure that we're doing what is right on behalf of our residents, and do it in a way that doesn't result in reduction of services, doesn't result in layoffs of workers, but makes city government run more efficiently and effectively. And that we are always going to make the tough but right decisions. And that's important. What I've said to all the folks that have worked for me over these four years, don't tell me what the political decision is. Tell me what the right decision is first, and then we'll figure out the politics. But we can't cut and paste our vision for what we should be doing based upon who is going to vote, who's going to be in opposition. Obviously, we're not naive. We know that that matters. But I wanted their best advice on what was the right thing to do, and then we craft a strategy to figure out how we get there, given the, the political vagaries. Those things, I think, are, have been critically important in the work that we've done. And so guided by these set of principles and philosophy, um, we closed the 2019 budget gap. And when the pandemic shut down big portions of our economy the next year, and our budget deficit surged to $1.2 billion, we didn't waver from that philosophy. And guess what? We closed that gap as well. And we did this for all the four budgets that we presented uh, to city council during this administration. So through tough times, through good times, we did not waver in our approach to how we set our fiscal house in order. And that was critically important. And part of putting our fiscal house in order was making sure that we made good on our obligations, first among them, our pension obligations. No gimmicks, no tricks, no kicking the can down the world for somebody else to solve the problem. We determined that we were going to climb our pension ramp, and that's exactly what we did. And while we were at it, we also climbed our debt ramp. These are critically important things. So for the first time in 15 years, the funded ratios for the city's pension funds have actually increased. And for the first time in city history, all four pension funds were funded on an actuarial basis. <clears throat> we ended the practice of scoop and toss and climbed the debt ramp, as I said, and we are now paying down over $399 million a year in debt, which is good news for our taxpayers. And because we made the smart fiscal choices, in FY 2023, we closed one of the smallest gaps in 16 years at $127 million. <clears throat> and folks, the city will continue uh, to benefit from these structural solutions that have been created through the lowest sustained budget gaps in the city's history. And by the way, we found $1.2 billion in structural solutions over time. That is looking inward, figuring out how we can make city government run more efficiently, not with one-timers, but with sexual solutions that carry forward from budget to budget. And so I will tell you, um, as one of the big reveals today, that the projected structural uh, deficit for FY 2024 that the new administration and the city council will have to grapple with is $85 million. <clears throat> And 
and all without the impact of federal funding and while uh, adding transparency uh, to the budget gaps. This is good news for everybody. <laughs> and I'm proud that we've been able to make the fiscally responsible uh, decisions. But when you make those fiscally responsible decisions, that gives you the space and the ability to make key investments. And let me um, talk about those for a moment. I'm proud that we invested $8 billion through a couple of programs. Chicago Capital Works, our first sustained capital program going over multiple years so that we can plan and then we can build over multiple uh, year budget cycles. The Ch Chicago Recovery Plan, which, through which we have pushed out um, over um, $300 million to do infill development, but also to support community-based organizations and small businesses throughout our city. And of course, our signature economic development plan, Invest Southwest. Just returned this morning from a ribbon cutting in Bronzeville for another Invest Southwest development. We are doing great things to change around the fortunes of people and neighborhoods and businesses all across the city because we started with making the right fiscal choices and then we had the room to grow and make key investments. <clears throat> you can clap for that. <laughs> Another thing that I'm proud of is that we made transparency around our city finances a key um, driver of the work. Um, one of the first acts was to bring the pensions and the debt service costs into the corporate fund so people could see actually what we were doing. Now that may not seem like a big deal, but we've heard from rating agencies and others who have been around for a long time. Um, the fact that we are transparent, that we're showing actually what our debt is, what we owe, and how we're dealing with it is a big, big deal and I think has given us a lot of credibility with people who watch our city finances. And so what's been the result? Well, one of the big results is um, hard work pays off because since August of last year, we have received 13 rating upgrades across the various credits that the city is involved with, independently validating our long-term strategy and three positive outlooks. And just to put it into context, uh, for many of these upgrades, it's the first time in 20-something years that the city has um, gotten positive ratings from the rating agencies. And now, as a result of the hard work of this team, every single one of our city credits is investment grade and moving us out of junk bond status. <laughs> and we're pleased to see uh, that we have other revenue streams that are coming that, again, are not going to be dependent upon asking the taxpayers to do more. We're sitting proximate to uh, the temporary casino in Medina Temple. That casino and then the permanent one will add uh, 2.7 billion in financial value. And the city secured a second new revenue stream by getting the first new water customer um, in, what is it, Jenny? 40 years. 40 years, <laughs> right? 50% of our water customers are in, uh, the, from our suburban customers. When we came into office, we were losing customers. We lost some of the um, north um, side uh, suburban customers uh, to Evanston. There was a threat on the south side to Hammond, Illinois. We dug in, got to work, and we landed a deal with Joliet that will bring a billion dollars in additional revenue over the life of that contract. Now, as you know, we normally do these budget forecasts right before we start the official budget season. But because we may not be here, not all of us, um, we thought it's good for us to do this now and share the news with you. So, <clears throat> drum roll please somewhere. <clears throat> I'm happy to, to, to share with you that because of the hard work of this team, but because of the resiliency of our economy, we are looking at a projected $554 million surplus for 2022. Wow. <clears throat> and a $143 million surplus projected for this year, 2023. All in for the two years, a surplus 
yes, a surplus, that we can say that word here in Chicago about city finances, of $697 million. And yes, um, I will be signing an executive order that places these revenues into an advanced uh, pension fund, making sure that we continue to prepay our pension debt and continue to meet our obligations there. So um, let me uh, get to uh, the questions from this team and then we'll get to uh, audience questions. Um, and this is a question uh, for all of the folks that are up here. Um, and this is a question for all of you and I'll remind you. Um, help us understand in your own words briefly, um, what you think helped the city succeed um, through these difficult last uh, four years. And I'll start with Jenny Bennett, our CFO. Hi everyone, good morning. Mm -hmm. um, as many of you who know me know this about my approach towards city finances, but I live and breathe fiscal discipline. It's so critically important given the magnitude of the budget gaps that we face that we maintain fiscal discipline so the actions and decisions that we make today live and persist for Chicagoans for years to come. I will tell you that I, you know, love, I, I am I, you know, a true believer in fiscal discipline, but the mayor is more of a fiscal steward than I am. She has held so tightly to doing what's right throughout the entirety of the four years that we've been facing difficult financial challenges. Um, and, and very importantly, she's the one who has to wear the jacket for all the decisions that we make. Um, she uh, uses her political capital ultimately to get things done, casinos being top of them for uh, financial value for the city, and ultimately she's also the one who has to sell the story to the city of Chicago. I've seen her sell the story to rating agencies, which has helped, helped us secure the 13 rating upgrades that we received. I've also seen her sell the story to the city of Joliet and ultimately securing the contract that generated about a billion dollars of in incremental water revenues for the city. And so most importantly, tone at the top is very important. Um, uh, the mayor and her values and the agenda that she sets is very important. And I think that that's really what's helped us get through the last four years. So, so Jenny is, of course, being modest. Um, and I'll share that the first time that I met her, which was probably about four years ago, um, she came in to interview to be the CFO. And I've, I've shared this story in other, in other venues. And after our discussion, I wanted her to give me a hug because I felt like, okay, this is the right person. We're gonna be able to get through this and never look back. So thank you, Jenny, for your leadership. Susie Park. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, you know, I will echo what Jenny said, is that you know, a lot of this um, is really making some of these tough decisions. We've been through a lot over the last four years, um, and there've been lots of different scenarios, but really, you know, it's the leadership at the top. We could always bring to the mayor, sometimes good news, sometimes bad. <laughs> Um, but we say here are some options um, and you know the mayor no matter what is always what is the right thing to do you know um, I've been in government for a long time and I'm like well this is gonna go down this way or this might but she's always her first question is what is the right thing that we should be doing um, and that has really set the tone secondly I will add you know Jenny's the discipline between the two of us and we're I'm on board but we're also I'm also a collaborator so it's also you know we've had a lot of people in our you know really um, providing feedback and input to all of our budgets. Um, you know, when, when, the MERS, when we first started, the mayor's like, we're doing engagement, get it ready. Um, and you know, it was my first day in, you know, at the office. Um, but you know, it has also been a really big part of all the work we've done is not just you know, what the four of us might think, but hearing from everyone, all the, all the, um, the city council, um, all of the residents in our communities. You know, we've done a lot of um, public engagement as well to really hear what's important to our residents. So also keeping that in mind, really the collaboration um, with the entire city uh, has also been a really big factor, I think, in our success. And let me, let me underscore the, the point that, that Susie made. Uh, any refugees from uh, the daily uh, three regional budget hearings, you remember those? It started like six o'clock, go till the last person had exhausted themselves. And you never really knew uh, the comments that were made, how they were actually incorporated uh, into the budget. We just determined we were gonna do things a very different way. Um, and we helped educate folks about the budgeting process, which is um, not for the faint of heart, and I think difficult for the average resident to understand. Um, but we did it and then asked their specific feedback through good times and bad, and particularly in the good times about what were the kind of investments that they wanted to see us make as a city to really uplift the quality of life. So we value 
uh, community input in very profound ways. And you will see in the things that we have done that the feedback that we've gotten from residents has made its way um, into our budgeting process. And again, this process is led by Susie and her team um, all across the city for four years. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we were the better for it. Reshma, tell us your thoughts. <laughs> So I think we're all echoing the same thing here, but structural stability is probably the thing that I can think about most, where all of us have been following, and really it's coming from the mayor. The mayor, when we would come in, and those were tough budgets, right? $1.2 billion when we were talking about 2020, going into 2021, um, and even in the last four years, we're making decisions, some tough decisions, and a lot of debates going on internally, but um, I think you know, that shows that we collaborate well together, and the mayor always pointed us to, don't do something that's just one time. Look at the long-term impact. And the budget culminates what we do throughout the whole year. That just solidifies what we do throughout the whole year. So she's pushing that point out through all the departments uh, throughout the year. What are you doing, whether it be for us, you know, we're doing a lot of fines and fees reforms, let's say in our departments, other departments are doing development. Um, we're looking at you know, physical structural solutions as well as the financial. And pushing that throughout all of our various departments, I think has made us um, successful last few years. So Rush, let, let, me, let me stay with you. Um, one of the things that we did in our first year in office was start the process of instituting fines and fees reform. Um, if you could give folks kind of a context for what we were looking at, how far the debt stretched back, and then what we did to really lift the burden of city debt to off the backs of, of residents. So when the mayor came in, when the administration came in, we were looking at over a $4 billion debt structure of just accounts receivable, right? What people owed the city. And a lot of this debt went back to the 1960s. So you know, this is various types of debt. You're talking about vehicle-related debt. You're talking about administrative hearings, uh, water, ambulance fees. And the, the message we got from the mayor, which made very clear, is you have to come up with not only a fines and fees reform, but we have to look at this comprehensively. There's not only individuals getting impacted, there's businesses getting impacted. And we saw more of that happening with the pandemic, when businesses were really impacted. And we're trying to find ways for them to be able to you know, afford to pay back what they owe to the city, but also making it more equitable, so getting rid of those older types of fines and fees. Over the last four years, we've um, waived almost a quarter of a billion of debt um, from all the portfolios that we have there, and with um, very targeted plans like the utility billing relief program, where we're already waived off to, uh, 37 million to over 21,000 households, and we're looking to team up, and we are teaming up with state and uh, federal agencies to be able to do more of that. We also have the Clear Path Relief Program that has helped over 41,000 motorists, um, and that's gotten rid of over 31, $31 million dollars worth of debt. And now, just most recently, we started three and a half months ago the Administrative Debt Relief Program, which impacts a lot of businesses. Um, small businesses as well, um, as well as individuals, and we've already waived eight million from that program. We've looked at vehicle fines and fees. Um, we've looked at many different structures, um, like ambulance fees, and really what we're trying to do is this, this debt wasn't helping us, right? We're not collecting a bunch of money from way back when, and it's just burden that we were adding on. What we saw when we implemented programs like the Utility Billing Relief Program is that it didn't impact our revenues. Our revenues actually were stable, and they're starting to grow. We saw a lot of people who weren't paying anything to the water system or sewer system are now paying back. And you know, it's, it's a sense of pride to be able to say that I can pay for the things that I use um, on your, in your daily lives. So I think it helps a lot with not only just reducing that debt, but also with morale, whether you're an individual or a business. So we, we stop water shutoffs, right? We, the city of Chicago used to routinely, if you fell behind, they'd cut you off from water, if you can imagine. And we gave people a way, not only uh, to, to end that practice, but gave people a way to pay back their old debt. So they didn't worry about not having water in their home, losing uh, their homes. Um, we stopped the horrible practice of driving people uh, into bankruptcy because they had non-moving violations of city debt for parking, uh, for um, other non-moving violations. Um, and I'd like to share this story. I was down in uh, Inglewood a couple summers back. Um, and we were doing kind of a food giveaway and mask and so forth. So I'm literally standing on the street as traffic is going by. 
This dude driving his big white car drives by and he says, hey, Lightfoot. Now, when somebody yells your name out like that, <laughs> you probably think nothing good's gonna come from it. But I will tell you what he shared is, thank you. I got my driver's license back. I got my car back. I can drive my kids to school and I now have a job. And I can't tell you the number of times that somebody has come up to me on the street, in a grocery store, um, or otherwise, to share that story that the work that we did actually had real impact on them. And as the saying goes, the proof is in the pudding. So many people have gotten their lives back on track, were able to get jobs, were able to drive legitimately, um, because we said, this makes no sense that we have this debt stretching back forever that we're never going to be able to collect. We're keeping people out of the economy. We're driving them into bankruptcy. There's got to be a better way. And as Russ said, there was a lot of skepticism. Oh, how are you going to make up this money if you're giving, uh, forgiving this debt? We have done better by doing the right thing in this situation. It's one of the things that I am personally incredibly proud of, and Reshem and her team are at the heart of this work. So thank you for that. <laughs> Jenny, let me go back to you. You know, I quickly said 13 rating upgrades, three positive outlooks. What does that actually mean in real terms, and why is this so important? Sure, Mayor, that's a great mm. question. Um, I'll tell you, my husband, he is a PhD in literature, extremely bright, and he asked me the question, what is a rating upgrade anyway? <laughs> Gotta tell you, <laughs> like a knife in the heart to a CFO. <laughs> um, so, you know, ultimately the real question I think is what does a rating upgrade mean to Chicagoans? And ultimately what it means is roundly about $100 million of savings for every billion dollars that we issue, and the city of Chicago on average issues about $2 billion a year. What does $100 million mean? You can pay for a new high school with $100 million. You can pay for three new police stations with $100 million, and roundly about 56 miles of new repaved roads with $100 million. And that's each and every year that we issue that debt. Um, the city of Chicago has uh, received 13 rating upgrades, as the mayor noted, as well as three positive outlooks. And what the positive outlooks means is that the fiscal path that we've laid for the city of Chicago now, um, that if the city continues along that path, it should expect to see other, uh, further rating upgrades in 2023 and 2024. If the city doesn't see those rating upgrades at that point, then what it means is that we've reversed course on that path of fiscal stability. And so what we would expect is that if the city does continue along this path, that it should continue to see these savings and continue to be able to make investments in the city of Chicago. Under the mayor's leadership, we have um, passed three very large, uh, very large investment plans. She noted Chicago Works, um, Chicago Recovery Plan, and Invest Southwest. In total, that's $8 billion of investment in the city of Chicago. And just to provide context to that, our total debt outstanding is roundly about $28 billion. Um, it's a very large investment plan. They are largest in the city's history, each of them. And not only that, but within them, there are largest in the city's history investment plans as well. We have the largest vacant lot cleanup. We have the largest tree planting program in the city's history. Largest increase in mental health investments in the city's history. Largest increase in homelessness supports. Largest affordable housing round. Largest um, uh, uh, green uh, environmental uh, uh, investment program. We have the full-scale electrification of the city's light duty fleet over the next five years. It is really a tremendous amount of money that we have placed in investments in the city of Chicago, which the next administration will be able to take on. And so uh, what you know, I would offer is that we've um, now made that first down payment of those investments through some of the initial bonding that we've done. As the mayor noted, we reduced our total debt outstanding by $750 million over the last four years. We use that reduction in debt to then pay for that first installment all for without increasing our total debt burden. So ultimately, effectively for free. And that's what fiscal stability pays for. It pays for city investments. It pays for the improvement of, um, of Chicagoans and the lives that they live in the city of Chicago because we've walked this path of fiscal discipline. Great. Susie, <clears throat> people keep saying, oh, you know, this is all smoke and mirrors because they got all this federal money and there's going to be a fiscal cliff. What's the response to that? Um, yes, I've seen a lot of, of that conversation happening, and you know, I do want to set the record straight that we are not headed for a federal fiscal cliff. 
Um, you know, we, as many other large cities, uh, received, um, you know, during the pandemic, we had, uh, they had the CARES Act um, came first, and that was for immediate, you know, COVID response. Um, following that was the American Rescue Plan, and the city did receive $1.89 billion. Um, and some of that was used for revenue replacement, specifically for the revenue we lost in 2020. Um, there was a lot of guidelines around that. There was a calculation that we used. And what we did use that funding for, as it was required per Treasury guidelines, is really to help you know, bridge that gap as those revenues that were impacted by COVID are you know, coming back. And so we did use some of that. And we actually also um, tapered that. So it wasn't that you know, we split it even when we said you know, the most of that loss you know, we used for the 2021 budget. And then, you know, we used a little less um, in uh, 22, and then the last, you know, 150 came in 2023. But that is it. All the out years um, that you're gonna see in our um, budget forecast has is no federal funding um, that's really gonna be used to close uh, the gap. Now, we do also have um, investments, as Jenny talked about. The Chicago Recovery Plan does use a portion of those ARP funds to fund a lot of the investments that we also are doing across the city. That, along with the bond, um, really put that $1.2 billion Chicago recovery plan together. Um, that, those projects have until essentially 2026 um, to spend down those funds. And so there's a lot of that work is really in progress. And you know, what I hear um, from you know, all the conversations and what I hear from the community is that a lot of that is now starting. You, know, you see that and all the work that's coming from all of those uh, various projects that we've been working on for the last two years. Um, what I will say is that, you know, once, as those projects come to a finish, there will be an evaluation around that. You know, a lot of those are going to be one time. They were meant to really help, you know, people that were impacted by the pandemic and really, you know, lift that up back to, you know, where they were prior. Um, but there are some really good investments that we're doing, violence prevention, homelessness prevention, um, all of those things that, you know, we know is going to continue in some form. I think that is, you know, come 2027, uh, which exceeds our current projection uh, period, but we do know, um, and it's something that really needs to be built in and tapered in is, you know, what does that look like? Um, what are these programs? And in what form do we want to continue that? On average, you know, we think looking at these programs, it's probably going to be about a 60 to $90 million investment um, in some <laughs> form. So, you know, I think that is something definitely um, as the next administration is really looking at these investments and really deciding, you know, what is the right form? You know, what is the evaluation? What was the impact? impact um, that came from these projects and how do we want to continue it is something, you know, really for the out years. Um, but we do, you know, in my belief, it's something that you're going to build into as part of new investments. And we do new investments, you know, as part of the budget. It's not just about closing, you know, the gap and paying our bills. But, you know, every budget season, you know, we sit down with the mayor and we say, what are your priors in terms of investments? You know, there's always an add to your gap. It's not just about removing, you know, and lowering that, but really, you know, accounting for all the things that are really important um, to us and to our community. And so we also build that, and I expect that to also be built into any future budget. Budgets, um, to really, you know, work through some of those investments and in what form we want to see them continue. Thank you. So no federal <clears throat> fiscal cliff. No fiscal <laughs> cliff. All right. So in, on your chairs, you have this document. Um, hopefully you've taken a look at it. Um, but it kind of lays out um, what uh, the out year uh, projected budget gaps look like, where we started um, and where we're going. So we have a couple of questions. Uh, go ahead, Jenny. Mayor, I was also just going to mm. add on this page, one of the things that you see on the budget forecast and the mm. gaps, people always like to quote whatever that number is out there. But when you implement structural solutions in a fiscal year, so it's 85 million in 2024, then the next year you subtract the 85 from that because those solutions carry forward year after year. It's the you know, decisions that pay off year after year. And so what we you know, really expect is that should structural um, solutions be implemented in the budget gap year after year, it's 85, then 39, then 21 million. C the city of Chicago has never seen such sustained low budget gaps in its history. So one of the questions that we have is, can you talk a little bit more about, about pension reform? Then I, I'll the, let you guys decide who's going to take it. But what more needs to be done both here locally, but importantly, in Springfield? Jenny, you want to start? Sure. So the city has made an enormous climb of the pension ramp over the last four years. We've paid $1.3 billion more annually in our annual pension contribution. And that is the largest um, four-year climb in the city's history. 
In addition to that, as the mayor noted, for the first time in the city's history, we now are now paying an actually calculated uh, 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 contribution for all four of our pension funds, and that occurred in fiscal year 2022. I would offer, just as a point of history, um, Mayor Daley in 2010 created the Commission to Strengthen Chicago's Pensions, which at the time had a projection of the city's pension funds going insolvent first in 2022. Just dotted straight line that went straight to zero. And now in 2022, for the first time in the city's history, we are paying an actually calculated contribution. Um, what we know, though, is that that con contribution, which is set by state statute, isn't enough to get to full funding. It only requires us to get to 90% funding by 2025, 2055 and 2058. Mm -hmm. And so um, as a part of the fiscal year 23 budget, we passed an advanced pension funding policy, which basically says that the city will pay what is necessary to keep the net pension liability stable over time. And that was a critical part of what drove us to a rating upgrade. Um, what I would offer for the city and in terms of what um, is a more appropriate level, which helps us to start paying down the pension credit card, is ultimately <clears throat> paying what's called an ADC, which um, is an actually determined contribution. And the long and the short of it is, is that it targets 100% funding as opposed to 90% funding, so that effectively you get to full funding at some point. Um, in addition to that, what um, is also difficult for the city is as you're making this fairly large climb to the pension ramp and ultimately having pensions squeeze out other expenses in the operating fund, having more burdens being placed on the city of Chicago, i.e. increased um, costs, is very difficult. And, one of, and we know that there are a number of bills in Springfield that are being considered at this point for additional pension benefits. Um, some of them largest in the city's history, the largest in the state's history by way of uh, pension uh, benefit increases would be an extraordinary burden to the city of Chicago and is not currently included in the budget forecast. So, so Jenny's being very nice and I'll be more direct as I always am. <laughs> <clears throat> Tell Senator Rob Martwick, we don't need a bunch of unfunded mandates for pensions. Because um, those bills, are, he's the author and his fingerprints are all over them. So if you don't want to pay more in taxes, you want to keep us on the trajectory that we're on, tell Rob Martwick, enough. No unfunded pension obligations. We are going to meet our burden as we have. As pensions are uh, our right, and we have to make sure that we meet them. But saddling the city with more pension obligations that aren't paid for, anybody in Springfield awake down there, let's not do that. And number two on Springfield, hey, we haven't solved the pension problem in our city or in our state. Mis uh, municipalities like Chicago, but all up and down the state are struggling because of the cost of pensions. We've got to meet our obligations, but we've got to do it in a way that doesn't fiscally bankrupt the cities. If we don't change that by getting real common sense pension reform in Springfield, and again, not pulling the rug out of the retirees who are depending upon it. That's not the answer. But if we don't make this right, all that we are all doing is servicing our pension debt. And we'll be able to do very little uh, beyond that. So that's critically important. Um, we're winding downtown. Let me uh, just get to one more uh, question, um, which is, I assume, for me. What piece of advice around the city's finances would you give the mayor-elect as he begins preparing for uh, the 2024 budget? That's easy, because I've already shared it with him. Don't screw it up. <laughs> We're delivering, we are delivering through hard work, hard work um, and sacrifice with our partners and city council, the best fiscal situation that the city has been in decades. We're delivering this up on a silver platter. Continue the work, stay the course, and things will continue uh, to shine bright for the city of Chicago and our finances. I think I'm getting the hook. So thank you all for listening. Thank you for being here. And thank you for your support. Is this working? Uh, I think another round of applause is in order for all of these women. And Margaret, I forgot to say, this is the best fiscal team that the city, I think, has ever seen, bar none. These ladies have done unbelievable work, sacrificing um, tireless work um, seven days a week, uh, particularly during uh, the budget cycle, being thoughtful and innovative um, and making sure that we're not just looking at lines on a spreadsheet, but we're thinking about the consequences for real people. These folks are heroic. Thank you.
I know you all have very busy jobs to get back to, so we will wrap. If you have time to stay and connect with folks, please do. There are some wonderful people in this room. I know um, they'd be happy to you know, have, say goodbye and say a few words. Um, but if you have to get going, that's great too. Thank you for being here. Check out our website for future events. Have a great week. Thank you.